ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to In Conversation with the Royal Butler. Now, today's conversation is about a member of the Royal Family who is sadly no longer with us, but one that in my mind, and I'm sure in many other people's minds, without question, helped shape the modern Royal Family we have today. And of course, I'm talking about the late Diana, Princess of Wales. Now before I actually begin today's conversation, one thing I do need to make very clear is that I didn't work for Diana Princess Wales and sadly I didn't even know her. I'd love to have known her, uh, as I'm sure many of you would as well, but sadly I didn't. She died um, a few years before I actually joined the Royal Household, but her death, uh, or I should say the day that she died, certainly as with everyone else, had a huge impact on me and gave me, uh, I suppose, a kind of drive to want to work for the Royal Family. And I will come back and explain what I mean uh, by that shortly. So I felt this was a fantastic conversation to have today because Diana, Princess of Wales, would have been 60 this month. In fact, the other week, there was an unveiling of a statue at Kensington Palace uh, in her memory. I should mention the statue was actually commissioned a few years ago, I think it was around about 2017, by Princes William and Harry and the Spencer family, but it was only unveiled due to COVID. It was only unveiled recently, and the timing was amazing because obviously it was, it, it would have been uh, the late Diana Princess of Wales's 60th birthday, and it was also a wonderful occasion because I got uh, two young princes, William and Harry, back together for that day, where we saw them uh, doing something together, which is is lovely because we haven't well. The last time was sadly at Prince Philip's funeral, uh, but this was a, a, a joyous, uh, a joyous occasion because they were remembering their wonderful late mother uh, and honouring with this statue. So it was, it was. I think a lot of you would agree, it was a, it was wonderful to watch and to see them together. I think there was a lot of people kind of watching their body language to work out if they were, how they were getting on and how things were progressing. But I think from from watching it myself. I thought it was it was very good, and I thought they they looked like they actually got on, which was which was lovely. Uh, as we know, with all families, you can have breakdowns and there can be problems, and we all know what's taking place, uh, obviously within the the royal household or the royal family. But this was one occasion which was lovely to see the brothers uh, united together with uh, the mother's family uh, for such a wonderful wonderful reason. So Diana was born on the 1st of July 1961 to a John and Francis Spencer who were at that point the Viscount and Viscountess Althorpe. And of course lastly he went on to become the 8th Earl of Spencer. I always thought he was a very down to earth uh, friendly kind of chap if I can say that. That's how he came across and I think a lot of you would agree. And of course Diana absolutely adored her father. I mean, I think without any question, she was very much, if I can say, a daddy's girl and, and uh, adored her father and, and spent a lot of time, a lot of time with him. And I think, I think, I know he'd have been extremely proud of what his daughter achieved in her in her lifetime. But sadly, he, he died quite young. And I think it was something that Dana would have would have struggled with when, when he died. But as I mentioned, uh, she was born uh, to her parents, uh, John and Francis Spencer, on the Sandringham estate, because that's where her father and mother lived at that point, in Park House on the Sandringham estate. So she grew up uh, at, at Sandringham, which obviously is where the Queen and the Royal Family spend a lot of time. 
It's one of the Queen's private homes that I'm sure I've mentioned before. And of course, growing up there meant that she got to know the royal family from a very young age. In fact, I remember reading that she would play with Prince Edward and Andrew as a youngster. So her family were, were very much known to the royal family. Her father was actually an equerry to the Queen Mother and to the Queen. And her grandmothers had also been ladies in waiting to the Queen Mother. So she was very much known to the royal family and the, the royal family and her family had very close connections. Now, I don't know if you know this little fact that she was known as Dutch, which is short for Duchess, because the family always said that when she was a youngster, she acted and behaved like a Duchess. So she was nicknamed Dutch, which I think is a, a fantastic nickname um, to give someone. And obviously, she at that point, she knew she was destined for, for great things. <laughs> Sadly for Diana, her parents divorced in 1969, so she was quite young, I think she was only about seven at that point, and they did remarry separately, but of course this would have had, uh, I'm sure, as many other people have gone through similar experiences with, when parents divorce, it would have been upsetting for her, but as I mentioned, I think it, she became a lot closer to her father, um, and spent a lot of time with with him and which was quite obvious and quite clear to to see and and he as i said he absolutely doted on her from again what we could see and i think that was quite um that's what was quite special when you saw that relationship they both had and it's been well documented over the years as well her father remarried in 1976 to rainy countess of dartmouth now it's well known and again documented that dana didn't have a close relationship with her stepmother um, which obviously would not have been easy and she didn't seem to have a huge amount of contact back then with her mother as well and I'm going obviously by what was, was said at the time but she did without question keep uh, her relationship with her father. Diana was always described when she was young as being very shy and, and I think that's something we, we're all aware of because whenever you think of Princess Diana and you see images of her and her mannerisms, the way she is, she always comes across as, as slightly timid and shy. And of course, over the years, she, uh, if, if I can say, she overcome that. And But that was such a lovely thing about her. And I think that drew us, all drew us to her. You know, we all um, felt for her because obviously this was this young, shy uh, girl. And we all wanted to kind of um, reassure her. I say we, I'm talking about obviously the, the public wanted to reassure and, and welcome her when she became a member of the British royal family. Now this might shock some of you, but Diana actually met Prince Charles when she was 16 and he was 29. I should mention that Prince Charles actually was dating Princess Diana's eldest sister, Sarah. So it, it was, um, that's how obviously she came to get to know Prince Charles um, from that point of view. And it wasn't until 1980 when they were at a country house, a polo match, I think, together. Uh, and at that point, she would have been about 19, and I would say he was about 31, 32, when I think um, things, maybe they realised there, there was something there, and things obviously began to develop. He then invited her to Britannia and of course to Bermoral. And uh, th those were two uh, very, I mean, to be asked to go on Britannia was quite a, a, an honour, because again, it's the, it was the royal family's private yacht. And then to go up to Memorial Castle, once again, the private home of the Queen and Prince Philip and the royal family, to be invited up there would have also been quite a, quite a big deal. So, but she went up there, she obviously enjoyed it and made a good impression and, and quite rightly won the whole royal family over because it was in 1981, uh, I believe it was on the 24th of February, was when the engagement was uh, announced. I think they got engaged a few weeks before, but it was only officially announced on the 24th of February 1981. I should also mention that the engagement 
ring that we saw the future princess wearing is the same engagement ring that Prince William gave uh, Kate Middleton, obviously later the Duchess of Cambridge. It's the same engagement ring, the sapphire, the blue sapphire engagement ring um, that we saw Prince William's mother wearing, which was obviously quite a significant uh, and a big, um, quite a big thing because it was it was such a lovely touch that here her son was able to give his mother's his late mother's engagement ring to his future wife. And of course they got married on the 29th of July 1981 at St Paul's Cathedral. St Paul's, which is not normally the venue for royal weddings, it's normally Westminster Abbey, but St Paul's held more um, more people. So because this was going to be a huge royal wedding, it made sense for it to be held there. And I understand that 600,000 spectators lined the streets to watch and 750 million people tuned in to watch the wedding of the future Prince and Princess of Wales. wedding dress is on display at this moment in time at Kensington Palace so if you want to see the beautiful wedding dress which at the time I believe cost about £9,000 uh, it's well worth going to see. I've seen it, I've actually gone and I saw it when it was at Althorpe and it was it was beautiful, uh, quite amazing. You'll remember it because it was quite crushed when she came out the carriage at the time that was quite a big thing but when you see the dress, it's it's quite um, stunning, and also it kind of it, it can also be a little bit emotional because when you know what's happened in the history, it's it's quite it's quite special when you actually see it. So it's well worth going along to see the exhibition while it's on at Kensington Palace. So she would have then become one of the most senior members of the royal family, uh, one of the most senior royal ladies, because you had the Queen Mother, the Queen, and then it was the Princess of Wales, which is quite a, quite a responsibility, especially at such a young age. I mean, she'd only just turned 20, so it really was quite a, um, quite a, a, a huge amount to suddenly take on. And so you can understand why she was slightly shy and slightly nervous at the, at the time. And of course they went on to have their two sons, Prince William was born in 1982 and Prince Harry was latterly born in 1984. And by all accounts, the, the family at that point were, were, to all of us, were very close. I mean, they were, they were the, 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 model, the model British royal family. They were the future of the royal family, the Prince and Princess of Wales and their sons, Prince William and Prince, Prince Harry or Prince Henry. So it was um, at that point. I think everyone was was excited and and about the future of the royal family. We knew it was secure. We knew that there was a a future king and his consort wife, um, future queen, and and the line of succession was guaranteed with the with the two sons. So there was a great reason for people to be excited and joyous. And and you know, as time went on, the other other members of the queen's her other sons got married and. Her daughter was already married, and so it was such a good it was such a good point in the history of the royal family, and you, you could nobody could ever visualise not only the separation but of course what would happen to Diana uh, in that car crash. I mean, it would never have crossed anyone's minds that the the the, the scenes that were about to get played out in in the years coming, which is very sad. It's really sad because at that point like everybody, and I was very young at this point, but I do remember my parents being very proud and, and excited about the, the Royal Family in, in the 80s and um, how it was kind of, you know, watching documentaries and programmes with them and kind of seeing how people just loved this family and how it was, it was just the future. It was just the future. It's amazing how things could so drastically change.
Now, sadly, obviously, I think it was 1993-94, the Prime Minister at the time, John Major, announced the plans of the Prince and Princess of Wales wanting to separate. And, of course, they actually divorced in 1996. Without getting into it too much, obviously, we're aware, we all know of those famous interviews that both Prince Charles and Princess Diana gave. Uh, Prince Charles, I think, did his in 94, and then Princess Diana gave one in 95 when it became very obvious and very clear that of how this was going to play out and, and it was very sad and I think everybody was just shocked and, and saddened and uh, at this divide and it divided, it didn't just, it wasn't just within the family, I think it also divided a lot of households and couples, um, uh, people uh, across the country and the world um, and it, it was very sad. I, I, I think I'd be wrong to say that the, the a majority of people very much felt for Princess Diana. And I think it was also because of her age and, and everything. And, you know, we don't really, we don't know what went on behind closed doors. We really don't. And we only know what they've told us. And it's wrong to speculate and to kind of make judgment. But it is sad. And, and I think you all agree with me. It was really sad for the young boys, the young princes of how, how this this played out. And because no, you know, no parents, I'm sure, you know, as we all know, you don't really ever want to be in that situation of a divorce or a separation, but it happens. And I think the, the thing you try to do is, is to protect, if, if you've got children, it's to try to protect their children. But when you're members of a family, like the British royal family, it's, it's, very, it's very tricky. You, it's, it's not that easy because the world is watching, the world's media is watching. And so it becomes a very... Um, a very tricky situation. Now, of course, after the divorce, Dana technically lost, well, she lost her HRH, Her Royal Highness um, title, so she was no longer Her Royal Highness. Uh, and she was only known from that point as Dana, Princess of Wales, which is quite common, obviously, to keep the title of her husband as uh, he is the Prince of Wales. So she became known as Dana, Prince of Wales. And of course, many of us, I say many of us, but a lot of people still refer to her as Princess Diana, uh, or even Diana, uh, which I don't think she, I think she didn't mind. I think she um, just wanted people still to, I think she was somebody that wanted people still to want her. I mean, I, I think she still wanted to do, to do good. She wanted to help people. We know this, you know, look at the charity work she undertook. The, the organisation she got involved in. She was very keen at trying to continue in this new role. The sad thing is that role was very much short-lived, um, but she did an amazing job of it. And she set up her home at Kensington Palace, which ironically was where they originally started off, her and Prince Charles. And I don't think she really came back to Highgrove. Now, when I started working for Prince Charles, that was the thing, it was, um, quite special for me was to be at Highgrove and knowing that's where she, Prince Charles and William Harry spent a lot of time when the boys were growing up. Beautiful home, real family home and you know it, it was sad to think you know this is a house, well I say sad but it was also quite amazing that this is somewhere that this this young girl spent her kind of early years of marriage and, and bringing up her family. I always remember being told the most wonderful stories about Diana Princess of Wales. And when I say the most wonderful stories, real genuine insight into what she was like as a person. She was always polite to everyone. And as well as I'm talking about the public, I'm talking about the staff, you know, behind the scenes. She was always polite, always friendly, tried to make the staff laugh, you know, tried to always, it was always a kind of giggle, um, having a bit of fun. And one of my favourite stories I remember being told um, is that uh, what she used to do um, when she'd, if she was up at Sandringham, she would lean out of one of the, the in the butler's pantry, there's a, uh, from memory, there's a glass roof, and you could look right up to um, part of the building that goes further up, um, other, other rooms, and she used to kind of lean out a window and kind of pull faces at the, the, the butlers or the staff in, in that room to make them laugh and to giggle and I could imagine that and I loved that and I remember you know I used to kind of look up thinking amazing to think that at that point I suppose 20 years earlier she would have been up there you know 
leaning at those, this window and as they pulling faces and using their hands to make faces and things and just to kind of make them giggle and it just gives you an insight into what a, a kind person she was because the reason I say that is when you're a butler and you work for any kind of family it can be quite long hours it can be hard work and those little things make it make it fun you know they, they, they lighten it a little bit so that's exactly what she was doing was just making um, people just kind of giggle and laugh and and enjoy enjoy being there as well which I think is 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 wonderful You always, I always got told about that compassionate side of she would, you know, go and visit staff members and their families and, you know, always wanted to make sure everyone was okay and looked after and just had that. So that caring, that caring side to her was, was not just for our eyes in, and for the media. It, it was very much how she was as a person. But we know that. We've heard these stories over the years and... She was somebody that just that just cared um, a lot about people, whether it be friends, family, members of the public, or even or even her staff. I mean, we all know about those times. That I think there was a trip she made to visit a friend that was dying of AIDS, and she travelled from Balmoral Castle and drove to London. I mean, I'm sure some of you know, but that's a long drive. I mean, it's it's eight, nine, ten hours can be uh, that long, and she, with her obviously protection and, and drove down so she could be with her this 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 friend before he before he died and that just gives you an idea of this this lady and and what what she was like as a person that care inside to it so and that giggling that kind of fun giggling side um which is something that that i'm sure the rest of you agree it's something that that was fun that was and and it it also helped the royal family because it made them it made them feel more approachable. And the way she was with people, the way she she kind of would give them a hug or, you know, today you see Princess William and Harry hugging, well, before COVID, you see them hugging people. And a lot of people say, oh, well, that's amazing. The royals are hugging or the high-fiving or this kind of thing. Well, it, it, the mother did that. The mother showed that compassionate side. The, the mother would hug and with children, she would very much go down to their level and speak to them and and give them hugs and of course we see the uh, Catherine Middleton Duchess of Cambridge doing the same thing we see her going down and 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 if I can say even after the marriage Meghan Markle the Duchess of Sussex she was doing the same thing so she very much uh, Diana Prince of Wales very much led the way with this this approachable this humane kind of side and I say that because a lot of people said with the royal family they were very it was said that they were out of touch, they were very old fashioned, and that wasn't through any fault of theirs. It's just, it's a, it's a, an old institute. I mean, they've, they've been, a, if I can say that the British royal family have been around for, for century upon century, over a thousand years. And the way that things are done have obviously modernised, but it's very traditional. And then suddenly you had this young girl come in, fun, energetic, different outlook on how to do things. And I'm sure at the time, I'm sure courtiers would not have approved. I'm, I could, I'm positive courtiers would have said, oh, you know, that's not what the Princess of Wales does. And can you imagine telling Diana Princess of Wales you couldn't do that or that's not what's done? So I think she very much stood up for herself and without any doubt in my mind, and I'm sure a lot of you would agree, she modernised and changed the royal family for the better. I honestly believe that the royal family we've got today, its popularity popularity is obviously on the increase. People love the royal family. There's a huge amount of respect for the Queen. And I I honestly believe it, it, the Queen has done a lot of work to make that possible. That's There's no question on that at all. But I think Diana, Princess of Wales, very much helped with that and, and helped shape that. So, you know, she's she's done so much good for them. And, and I think, I'm sure they know. I'm sure deep down that's that's known and, I, and again that's why we see the younger princes very much carrying on these kind of traditions and things that their mother that their mother did. I think also when Diana gave her interview and said about how it was difficult and talked about men in suits and 
you know, making things, it, it was obviously quite difficult for her. I think that's not referring to members of the royal family, that's that's the kind of household, the, the people that kind of, the, the way it's kind of run. And I think, you know, obviously that's what she was kind of referring to. But, you know, she still didn't let it stop her. She still very much, um, was you all remember at that point, uh, after the separation, just before the actual divorce, she said she wanted to remain very much part of, of public life and wanted to be the queen of people's hearts. And I think you would all agree that she achieved that, even in death. A lot of people still um, respect her, admire her, and I think we'd agree that she's very much become uh, the queen of people's hearts, and even even to this very day. And we've seen that with the unveiling recently, how much, uh, and her 60th birthday, how much support and love there is still for her. I always remember the night that Diana Princess Wales died, I will like all of you, or most of you, I would never forget it. It was a Saturday night, and at this point I was living in Scotland, in Can You See? And my parents had had some friends round and they'd had a drink, um, a, social, a social evening, as they used to call it. And myself and my brother had gone to bed and I couldn't sleep. And I remember I had, I had my television on and we'd been watching movies, actually. We'd been watching movies till quite late and, uh, and then kind of put ourselves to bed. Uh, I had my own room and I remember it was about one in the morning so I was up quite late um, but I remember one or two in the morning uh, there was a news flash and it said that there'd been a car accident and that Dana had been involved in a car accident and, and had broke I think it said that she had broke her wrist or something and this is the days before social media or anything like that at all so you only went with what you saw on the television so I thought, oh wow, you know, this is this is awful. You know how that's terrifying, and and then I kind of kept it on and fell asleep, and then I woke up again in the early hours of the morning. It was about five in the morning or something, and I remember um, there was the anthem. I think it was the national anthem playing or something. I remember thinking, well, that's a bit odd. What's going on now? And then I put it on the other channel, and I remember it was two swans on a lake going around this lake and I thought what on earth is going on and then put it onto BBC One and there was the the, the reporter uh, the the um, at the news desk um, or sorry the presenter saying that she had been killed in this car crash and couldn't believe it I mean I think what age was I, I was probably about 18 at this point uh, 18 years old 17 18 years old and I couldn't believe it. I, I remember thinking it was it must be a mistake, and I went through and told what my parents and told them, and my mum was my mum actually got quite upset, and um, dad couldn't believe it. And we put the television on, and there it was. And I think, as with all of us, we, we everyone else that kind of woke up and to realise the news, it was just such a shock. I mean. I don't even need to say because we all remember those scenes outside Kensington Palace and Buckingham Palace and everything that took place. I remember later on that morning, probably about, I say later, but around about 8 a.m., half eight in the morning, going for a walk with my with my dogs. Uh, I think I just thought I just want to get the house and you know just 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 go for a walk. And it, the most beautiful part because where my parents lived literally just on the other side of, of where we lived, there was these beautiful fields and a forest. And um, so I went for a walk kind of on this, this kind of hillside and uh, the sun was, I say it's just coming up, it was up, but it was just, it was just beautiful. It was just such a, a, a beautiful morning, absolutely gorgeous. I remember it, I, I remember that as if it was yesterday. And I was just thinking how sad, you know, on this morning that, that she, uh, that Princess Dana had, that she had died, and you know what a beautiful world. You know you can have these kind of thoughts and how sad it is. And I felt so sorry for her boys. I mean, I was at that point about eighteen, and I just felt desperately sorry for what they, what they were going through. Uh, I couldn't even imagine, and just wanting to kind of be able to do something to help, or I don't know, just do something. Um, and I'm sure millions, if not billions of people, felt the same. And the rest of the day unfolded and obviously we saw Prince Charles 
uh, going to bring the body of Diana Prince of Wales back to the UK and just such devastating scenes. I mean, just so, so sad, so sad, the whole, the whole thing. And the next day was, um, the Monday was when I actually started as a butler. I began working at this house in Scotland and it was my, it was day one of me entering this profession. Uh, quite near again where I lived, it was in a, a place called Dilwini, Ben Older Lodge, uh, a few miles from where I lived at, at that point. As I said, I lived in Canusi. And um, so we travelled in and I, I started work on the Monday. And of course, as you can imagine, all everyone was talking about was the death of Princess Diana. And I remember going into this beautiful house, Ben Older Lodge, it's, it's partly old, partly new. And I remember going into the house and you know, as I said, everyone was kind of talking about what had happened. There was a, a staff there and everyone was kind of talking. And and I think from memory, I think the family, the family knew some of the royals and potentially even might have even met Princess Diana. Um, certainly knew Prince Charles, the new Prince Charles. And I remember going into uh, the drawing room of the house and there was a, there was a silver, um, there was a dish and it had... Uh, on it, it had it actually had Charles's name written on it. It was it was a a, a trophy of some kind and um, probably a polo trophy, and it had Charles written on it. And because of what had all just happened with um, Princess Diana, and and I remember looking at this, and that that point was when I decided I know what I want to do. I want to obviously do my training, but I want to become a butler for the Prince of Wales and his boys so that I can help look after them so that I could and I know it sounds ridiculous but kind of protect them and do something to help and even though it did take a few years it took about seven years to get to that point but that was my dream and ambition and I was determined to make it to make it happen and it was it was all because more so, even though I said I had this dream and ambition as a youngster, this made it, reignited it, and, and it was very much where I wanted to be, what I wanted to do at the end of this this um, training as a butler, if you like. Of course, it was quite a long bit of training because after being older, I went to Woburn. But, and again, Princess Diana used to visit Woburn Abbey. So there was a lot of um, connections with, with Princess Diana and, and things that I've done. Um, and I even know um, family members, and, and so there's lots of little connections. And um, so yes, yeah, so that's what what kind of really, really drove my passion to to work for them, or reignited that passion. And and as you'll know from my previous conversations, within a few years, that's what happened in 2004. I joined the household, the royal household of the Prince of Wales, and and then the Duchess of Cornwall, and got to know Princess William and Harry, and in my way, I think, got to keep that kind of promise to myself and even kind of, if I can say, to Princess Diana saying one day I want to look after and work for that family and that's what I did. And of course, the other thing I, I also remember is the funeral. Who wouldn't remember that amazing funeral so beautifully done but, but heartbreaking, absolutely heartbreaking. And again, it seems like yesterday you know, um, and and that beautiful song, Candle in the Wind, by um, obviously Sir Elton John, who was a friend of Princess Diana, and that's why I've used a piece of his music on this video, as I felt it was quite apt, because uh, she was very close to Elton John, and I felt that it was, um, as I said, it was apt to, to, to use the music in the video. Um, but... It was it was a beautiful, if I can say, it was a beautiful funeral, but it was heartbreaking just to, to hear and see um, the crowds and the people who were just devastated and the flowers. I mean, I didn't get to London to see it, but apparently the smell was extraordinary and I'm sure a lot of you will remember that. But, but absolutely heartbreaking. And of course, then she went home to Althorp. The, the Hess took her home and she was then buried on a little island on the Althorp estate, quite close to the main house. And I have gone to Althorp and I've gone and visited the grave. Uh, when I say the grave, I've, I've, I've kind of stood 
on the side and looked over and it's beautifully done. It's really nice. And I've gone around all Thorpe and again, well worth a visit if you get the opportunity. And for those of you who have been wondering, I have met uh, Errol Spencer a few times and um, it's, um, I, I think it's lovely that she, that she went home. I hope you've enjoyed today's in conversation slightly different because obviously I'm sharing memories that we all have and I'm looking forward to seeing your comments in the live chat to just to, to share with you uh, on these these memories because I know a lot of you will have memories as well and I say I hope you've enjoyed it and my few little kind of um, fun behind the scenes stories as well but as always I will see you on Wednesday for the next at home with the raw butler and then next Friday for our next in conversation with Rob Butler. But as I always keep saying, thank you for the likes. Thank you so much for the shares because it's amazing how many of you are sharing these videos and I'm, I'm really grateful for that because it builds the audience. And thank you for the comments. The comments are, are fantastic. I love the fact that I've said before, you all interact and chat to each other. I love joining in sometimes. Uh, I do try to go through them. There's quite a lot of comments, but I do try to go through them and I do try to respond, but please keep those comments and conversations going. But until I see you on Wednesday for the next At Home with Royal Butler, stay safe and thank you for watching and have a lovely weekend. Quickly to mention before I go, as always, Shumba, you can probably hear him, he is here. He's been on my lap. He's so loyal, uh, Shumba, to these conversations. It's unbelievable. There, there we go, quick, a quick hello, there we go. He has been here. He, he's been kind of sleeping. He's been kind of, he has been kind of dozing. Um, but I obviously just, I just want you to know that he is here so you know what the, the, the noises are because he's, he's been very vocal today. Anyway, uh, stay safe. Thank you for watching.